activist think tank with a proud 50 year history of advancing progressive public policy. Our work on the MPP team focuses specifically on fighting for a federal budget that prioritizes peace, economic security, and shared prosperity. So I'm gonna introduce our panelists and I'll, then I'll share a quick few words on why this conversation is so important um, and we'll get into our discussion. Uh, we're hoping to have time for Q&A tonight as well. So please do drop your questions in the Q&A function um, as we go along. Uh, so we're really fortunate to have such a great lineup with us tonight. Um, first, we have Kelly Stone, uh, who is gonna catch us up to speed on everything related to climate finance, why it's so necessary, um, and also an overview of the climate finance negotiations that'll take place um, at the upcoming COP, COP conference in November. Kelly is a senior policy analyst at Action Aid USA, where she works on the intersection of climate and land issues, um, bridging international policy spaces and frontline communities. She's especially focused on the UNF C negotiations, climate finance, and market mechanisms. She's an active member of the US Climate Action Network, where she currently serves as a co-chair of the International Policy Working Group. Before joining Action Aid, Kelly worked for a member of Congress. She holds a BA in political science from DePaul University and has a master's in global politics from the London School of Economics. Next, we have Valentina Delona, who will explain how worsening US-China relations are a growing barrier to climate action, including um, adequate climate finance, um, and talk a little bit about the geopolitical implications of getting it wrong. And she'll also touch on how focusing on how fostering US-China cooperation can not only prevent uh, great power violence, but can also help enable just climate action um, and a transition, uh, green transition for both countries and around the world. Valentina is the political director of Justice is Global, a grassroots advocacy organization that focuses on bringing popular, building popular support for progressive internationalism and solutions to address our shared global challenges. Valentina is a labor and community organizer who's now based in Baltimore, Maryland. She entered the advocacy world through the student movement against austerity during the global financial crisis and has subsequently led campaigns on student health care, sexual assault and migrant justice and has helped thousands of nurses win union elections during the COVID-19 pandemic. Justice is Global has been doing really excellent and incredible work um, in partnership with others, um, pushing back against unhelpful anti-China political rhetoric coming from Capitol Hill. So we're really lucky and excited to have her here uh, for tonight. Um, and then finally, we have Analia Schlager Dos Santos. Uh, who's gonna talk to us about the national campaign that's pushing US policymakers to stop thwarting our national responsibility uh, around climate finance and to pay our fair share. She'll also tell us about her work organizing young folks um, to become more politically engaged on climate finance and other critical environmental justice issues. Analia is currently leading, um, she's the climate lead justice organizer at the Minnesota Interfaith Power and Light Organization, a grassroots org based in Minneapolis, Minnesota, that's building transformative social movements to address the climate crisis. In this role, Analia created and direct, directs the statewide Youth Empower program, which trains young people in community organizing through the lens of environmental justice. She's a pa she is passionate about expanding access to, for to all forms of education, healing and building relations both hyper-locally locally and globally, and to redefining political power as we know it. She studied global relations and environmental justice at the University of Minnesota. So before we start, um, I also just want to uh, take a moment to acknowledge the incredibly complex moment that we're facing right now. Um, we are undeniably in the midst of a worsening climate emergency where massive biodiversity loss, warming, and severe weather are already causing widespread harm and destruction with the worst ecological effects affecting populations that are least responsible for its creation. And we know unmitigated, the climate crisis threatens the future of all humanity. Um, but we're not just struggling against ecocide, but also genocides currently in Gaza and Sudan and Congo there's a record number of wars ongoing and escalating around the world. The recent events in Lebanon um, illustrate a really dystopian new level of technologically enabled state violence in that regard. Um, we also are facing rising political extremism, pandemics, economic precarity, and hyper-militarization with record number of students and activists being assaulted, jailed, and murdered for nonviolent protests. 
Just this week, Honduran water defender Juan Lopez was murdered. Um, he had been organizing against open pit mining um, and ecological destruction in Honduras. Um, and in the US, we see record numbers of police uh, killings, including a mass shooting on the New York City subway just this week, just last week, um, over a $3 fare evasion. Um, all of this violence is indicative of a world in poly crisis. Um, we know the climate crisis is simultaneously exacerbating all of these challenges. We also know these challenges are intermittently interconnected and the main drivers of climate crisis, mainly corporations, extractive industries, defense contractors, and the powerful interests of fossil capital that fuel them are living legacies of colonialism and are at the root of all major threats facing working people around the world. At the same time that the US and other global North countries are driving climate change, climate crisis, um, and not only failing to follow through on our climate action, but um, these governments are also heavily investing in war and weapons, um, which is only furthering cycles of violence and climate collapse. We see this playing out in front of our very eyes currently right now in Gaza. Um, and I just wanna kind of for context, give the scale of discrepancy between funding for climate and funding for um, for war, um, to date, the United States has contributed a total of $2 billion to the Green Climate Fund, which is the UN designated Green Bank for Climate Action since it was created in 2010. Um, Congress has never once fulfilled a budget request to fund the Green Climate Fund, but Presidents Obama and Biden were able to move funding from the State Department to the, the fund. But while, so while Congress has been dead set against spending money on the Green Climate Fund, which is the leading mechanism for climate finance to the global South. Um, on the other hand, policymakers have approved at least $66 billion in foreign military finance since 2016 alone. Foreign military finance is essentially just money or grants provided to foreign countries to purchase US made weapons and to finance military training. Uh, it's just one of the many types of military assistance that's paid for by US taxpayers. Um, dis and despite you know, documented history of human rights abuses, um, uh, illegal settlement activity and ongoing genocide in Gaza, Israel receives $3 billion in foreign military finance aid each year to buy US made weapons. So that's nearly, that's more than the total US contribution to the Green Climate Fund, which is responsible for helping to finance uh, green energy projects in the whole global south. So we're up against a lot. Um, and we're here today to talk about that. But we also want to say that we know change is possible. Collective action has overcome massive challenges before, and we can do so again. Um, and it's more important than ever to build transnational solidarity and power across our movements, which is a big reason why we're here today. Um, to talk about the ecological and geopolitical importance of climate finance, um, and also to break down some of the silos that may uh, hinder progress in our movements. Um, so whether we're engaged in foreign policy or on domestic issues, or whether we're focused on climate issues or foreign policy, or whether we're geographically located in the belly of the beast or in communities fighting on the front lines against colonialism and imperialism, we are all connected, we all have skin in the game, and we all have power to help hold uh, power to account and make the world a better world possible. So we hope this conversation will be informative um, and also create opportunities to take action in whatever form that may be towards our collective security. So without further ado, uh, we're gonna turn it over now to Kelly to kick us off on what's been going on um, in the world of climate finance. Thank you so much, Hannah. I am... Um... We go. I'm going to share my screen quickly. Hopefully everybody can see that. Um, and then I can actually let's make sure I can actually move forward. Okay. Um, so uh thank you so much for having me. I am gonna be talking a little bit about what uh is happening in sort of the international climate finance, uh international climate negotiations this year. And there's two big themes I want to talk about, um, both of which are connected to each other. So the first is actually nationally determined contributions for 2035. Um, and then the second is the new uh, climate finance goal that we're expecting to be negotiated this year. Um, 
these are, uh, they're separate, but they are pretty connected. NDCs actually aren't even on the agenda for COP29 in Baku, but they are critical. They are, we're at a critical moment for that. Um, and they are deeply related to what is happening with the climate finance negotiations. So we are going to be talking about both of them today. Um, so first, for a refresher, just to talk about NDCs. So these, uh, for me, NDCs are really the heart of the Paris Agreement. So they are, um, as you might remember, Paris, unlike previous climate um, agreements, doesn't have anything saying you, United States, are going to do X amount of emissions reductions and you, European Union, are doing Y amount of emission reductions. There's no top-down targets. So it's really the, the Paris Agreement sets a lot of collective international goals, but then the actual action is put forward through these um, nationally determined contributions or NDCs by countries, and they are developed through an entirely domestic process. And um, so, you know, if you look in the Paris Agreement, there's a lot of should and not a lot of shall language about what NDCs should contain. Um, and what we expect them from them. So, and the basic cycle uh, is that NDCs come out every five years. They can be updated at any time, but they usually aren't. And then three years after that, there is a, supposed to be a global stock take where essentially everyone comes together and discusses how on track the world is for Paris Agreement goals. And then that feeds into a new round of NDCs. Um, so we had the first global stock take last year and now we're going into what is essentially the third round um, of nationally determined contributions. Um, most developed countries uh, put forward only mitigation, but all climate action is welcome under an NDC framework. And developing countries, particularly poor developing countries, will sometimes put forward what's called conditional NDCs. So while any, uh, while all countries are required to put forward an NDC, um, poor countries will put forward an NDC essentially with two parts. The first part is what they're definitely planning to do. And then the second part or the conditional part is what they would like to do, but need international support to accomplish. Um, so that's an important way that these two sort of threads that we're talking about today are connected. So I want you to keep that in mind. Um, so what's next and what's needed? I mentioned the global stock take already. Um, but so the, in the global stock take that we saw um, last year in Dubai at COP28, we saw the formal invitation for countries to come forward with new NDCs. That is, ex, um, these NDCs would set targets for 2035. So it is a 10 year time period, even though they are released every five years. Um, so we are expecting some this fall. Uh, the invitation was for starting this November to early into 2025, um, they were asking countries to put forward their NDCs. We're expecting a handful late this fall in November or December, um, probably including the United States um, to be putting forward to sort of try to set the precedent. Um, some things to look out for in this, this is probably the last round of NDCs that we would have any chance of getting back on track towards, well, not even back on track, to getting on track to trying to meet some of the key goals of Paris, including the temperature goals around limiting warming to 1.5. Um, and we'd need a massive increase in ambition in these NDCs, both in the targets and in the implementation to actually get there. Um, so uh, Analia is probably gonna talk more about this later, but some key things to be looking out for in a US NDC is if it is on a 1.5 pathway, if the target is in line with equity and justice and our fair share, if there is a commitment to a fossil fuel phase out, including a production phase out, um, and then also a climate finance commitment. Um, so let's talk about climate finance for a minute. Hannah already raised it. Um, but you, uh, I have been talking about these two tracks as interrelated, and they really are. Um, back in 2009, for those of you who have been following climate politics for a while, uh, negotiations that were supposed to lead to the, the new agreement to replace Kyoto, what became the Paris Agreement, very nearly collapsed. Um, and one of the things that they sort of 
that was used to sort of salvage momentum and try to reset was this commitment to by developed countries to raise $100 billion in climate finance per year by 2020. It, this was understood even at that time to be an inadequate political number. It was essentially made up out of nowhere um, that was intended to sort of get negotiations back on track and create this momentum where you could get an agreement like the Paris Agreement where all countries were taking on obligations for climate action. Um, the hundred, you know, it worked in that sense. You know, we moved towards Paris and we got the Green Climate Fund and lots of progress was made. Um, however, as far as actually meeting that goal of 100 billion by 2020, it's been a considerable failure, frankly. Um, it was, you know, I mentioned that it was an inadequate target already, but it wasn't met in 2020. Developed countries are now saying that they have met the target several years late. But when you look at what they are, how they are saying they met it, it's overwhelmingly loans, which is not what climate finance was intended to be and is increasing the debt burden in um, developing countries, which they do not need as they're facing all of these interrelated crises. Um, so there's very little new money actually flowing, which has profoundly undermined trust at the international negotiation level. Um, and so even when climate finance hasn't formally been on the agenda as it is this year, um, it has been the undercurrent of there is a lack of trust, a lack of certainty. Developing countries aren't comfortable taking on commitments when they aren't confident that the climate finance that they need and are owed, frankly, is going to be there. Um, so we weren't starting negotiations for a new climate finance goal in a good place. The 100 billion goal by 2020 was supposed to be in place from 2020 to 2025. And then starting in 2025, there was to be a new goal called the new, um, which is nicknamed the NCQG, which is a terrible acronym, but it is what we are. Um, but that is essentially just a new collective climate finance goal at the international level. So that has, there have been discussions leading up for years, and we are supposed to be agreeing at COP29 on this new goal. Oops, sorry. Um, so there are, uh, unsurprisingly, for <laughs> those following international relations, we haven't gotten anywhere close to where we need to be. Um, there are a number of outstanding questions about how this goal is going to be structured and shaped, but frankly, the two biggest ones and the ones that we are getting stuck on is who pays and how much money it's going to be. So who pays is what is called in negotiation speak the contributor base question. So going back to the original convention under the UNFCCC, uh, developed countries, it's a subset of rich countries with huge historical emissions were acknowledged to have climate finance obligations. And so now with the new collective goal, there is a question about whether it will continue to be that core set of countries that have that obligation, or whether there is going to be an expansion of that base to include some countries who maybe weren't seen as significant in 1992, but are now seen as economic rivals like China or significant players in this space like the Gulf states um, and whether or not climate finance obligations should be uh, assigned to them as well. Developing countries strongly oppose this, arguing both that you know, developed countries who have this climate finance obligations haven't been able to meet them. And so why should they be asked to pay when frankly the United States has not been paying up until this point as Hannah pointed out? Um, and there's also from an equity perspective, if you look at per capita emissions, there's not a strong case for some of these countries either. Um, but developed countries who see, who are, um, you know, like the U.S. see some of these countries as economic and political rivals and are unwilling at this point to take on obligations that uh, aren't assigned to some of these other countries. Uh, then the second question is how much? And this is where developing countries would like to start the conversation. Um, 
Uh, but developed countries have been completely unwilling to engage on sort of the amount of money that we are talking about until there is agreement on who is going to be paying that amount. Um, on the how much. Uh, so I have three figures there. Well, I guess two figures in a phrase. Um, so I mentioned that the 100 billion was a political number and that it was not in any way um, you know, needs based or adequate. Um, what the, so then the question became sort of how do we start, you know, where, where is this number going to go? Um, and early on there was discussion saying it should be trillions, not billions, and it needs to be needs-based. We still don't have a full comprehensive needs-based assessment for things like loss and damage and adaptation that frankly you'd really want, um, but it's getting there. Um, the pay up campaign and a large uh, section of civil society has been frame, saying that five trillion is a frankly the climate debt that is owed by the global north to the south. Um, and that is the moral framing and the moral baseline that we should be having this discussion in. Um, some developing countries have put forward a $1 trillion figure. Um, CAN International has also put forward a $1 trillion figure specifically for this new collective, um, for the NCQG, for the new collective climate goal. Not saying that that is adequate, but saying that it would be a start. Um, and then I have the question mark, because again, developed countries really have not been willing to engage on this discussion. Uh, thus far, even though the deadline is technically a few weeks away. Um, so that is what uh, we are expecting. The focus of Baku and COP29 to be is on this question of NCQG. Um, and while NDCs aren't on the negotiating schedule, they are going to be impacted by how these negotiations go. A poor outcome of NCQG is gonna be a problem and undermine ambition for the next round of NDCs, which we're gonna be seeing in the few months after this negotiation. Um, so they are incredibly connected and it's really essential that we see the climate finance move forward and that we embrace an ambitious grant-based number Otherwise, it's going to be impossible to get the kind of ambition we need out of the NDCs. Um, with that, I will leave it there and turn it back over to you, Hannah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kelly, for that. This uh, climate finance is very technical, so we really appreciate you breaking that down for us. Um, Valentina, can you share with us more about the geopolitical context and landscape around the upcoming negotiations? Um, yeah, absolutely. Let me just uh, share my screen. Can you see it? Okay, great. Um, yeah, so thanks Hannah and Kelly for, for the great introduction to, to the issue. Um, and, and thanks everybody for, for tuning in. Um, before I get into the weight that the US-China relation has on, on our opportunities to advance global climate justice, let me say like a couple of words uh, on Justice is Global and why we care about um, the U.S.-China relationship in the first place. Um, and I think it's important that I spell this out because we are, we are not a think tank, we are not a policy group, we are a grassroots organizing group whose mission is to build a base of activists and organizers in the U.S. that are willing to fight for structural reforms of the global economy to address uh, decades, if not centuries, of global economic, political, and climate inequality. Um, and we believe in uh, an internationalist progressive vision that ties poor and working people around the world together and sees corporate-led globalization as having led to the multiplicity of crises that Hannah was referring to before um, that we're facing today, rising domestic and global inequality, nationalism, uh, and of course, climate change. Um, but together with the challenges, we also see cl the climate crisis as an opportunity. Um, because the exacerbation of all the crises, um, of all these crises, has, has brought neoliberal globalization to be called into question. Um, 
we have an opportunity to push our leaders to rethink the global economy, to rethink where we invest and what we invest in, what kind of jobs and infrastructure we uh, we create uh, and build a global economy on different premises uh, that actually put people, uh, and by people, I mean all people across the globe uh, for, first. Um, and so why do we care about the US-China relationship? It's exactly because we care about this um, progressive vision. And we know that the trajectory of the US-China relationship will be enormously consequential for our chances of making this vision happen, um, both in the US and across the world. And so we, we are seeing growing calls for uh, military buildup and for reestablishing US dominance over China. And we see these in Congress, outside Congress, and kind of across the political spectrum. Um, we are told that China poses uh, an existential threat to uh, the American way of life. Um, and the assumption here is really that a global economic order, um, that we are in a global economic order where only one country can win, uh, or you know, to the extreme that you know, survival of one superpower entails the annihilation of the other. Um, and you know, while authoritarianism in China is real uh, and human rights violations are real and the rise of China leading to overcapacity issues in certain sectors of the global economy are real, um, we think that this trend of blaming China for kind of like all the hurt folks are experiencing in the US uh, is not only historically inaccurate, um, but also dangerous because it precludes any policy solution that fosters cooperation, um, and sort of uh, rules out any vision of a world where both both countries can can prosper. Um, and ultimately, it actually won't solve the problems uh, at hand. Um, and so there are many ways in which the US-China relationship uh, kind of going sour can affect our progressive agenda, but I will only highlight a few. Um, and Kelly already kind of hinted a little bit uh, to these. Uh, of course, increased hostilities prevent the two largest greenhouse gas emitters and economic powerhouses to fully engage in the cooperation that we need to solve um, climate change. Um, hostilities are a huge obstacle in UN climate talks. Um, you know, as Kelly already discussed, there is a non-postponable need to move a massive amount of finance to global South countries um, so that they can decarbonize and cope with climate impacts. Um, and US-China being the largest emitters and economies, their relations has a, a huge weight on our chances to move the type of climate finance that we need at the scale that we need. Um, but UN climate negotiations are fraught with finger pointing and, and back passing, and the US is constantly bringing up China's current emissions as an excuse for its own inaction. And, you know, Though it is true that China is currently the largest emitter um, of greenhouse gases, the fact of the matter is that when you look at the total historical emissions, um, it's super clear the US is by far the, the greatest total emitter. Um, and so, you know, this is not to say that China shouldn't do its part, uh, but that the imperative for the US to act on its fair share is independent of what China does, as we do hold the largest share of responsibility as well as the highest capacity to address the issue. And I think Analia will, will go a little bit more into, into that after me. Um, uh, you know, as Hannah already pointed out, military buildup means that our tax dollars are diverted away from our communities and directed towards uh, the military. Uh, we are just coming out of a week uh, called China Week in Congress where our legislators spend uh, a uh, disproportionate amount of time, uh, you know, trying to pass uh, anti-China bills instead of, you know, legislating on other things that uh, might be more important to their voters. Um, and finally, we 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 think that geopolitical conflict uh, also is a threat to human rights uh, worldwide. Um, the consequences of military buildup are already being felt by communities all over the world. Um, a good example of this is the Philippines, where the effort to contain China means that the U.S. is not only building military bases, but is also willing to support uh, an oppressive re regime um, that, you know, is also oppressing uh, environmental activists uh, on the ground, uh, you know, which means that this relationship has right now, not in a hypothetical future of war, 
huge consequences for human and environmental rights uh, all over the world. Um, and I believe uh, Brandon Lee, a human rights and environmental activist who was shot um, by the Duterte uh, forces a few years back, uh, is speaking about this very issue tomorrow in, in Congress. Um, and so yet, despite the fact that this relationship can kind of alter the sorts of climate justice, racial justice, global economic justice, and, and virtually dry up resources for all our progressive fights. We um we found that uh only people talking like the only people talking about the US China relationship were hawks in Congress and uh, China and foreign policy experts. And so Justice is Global decided, you know, we wanted to change this. Um, and so uh, we made a decision to bring uh, more of our progressive allies in deeper conversations around what a positive engagement with China on shared challenges looks like. Um, and that brought us uh, last April together with um, our allies at IPS here um, and at the Quincy Institute, we were able to uh, bring together representatives from 23 progressive organizations across all corners of um, the social justice ecosystem, labor, API groups, peace, foreign policy, racial and climate justice groups. Um, and at this retreat, we were able to um, put together an initial take for a progressive US-China uh, policy platform, um, which we published in, in July. Um, and hopefully we can drop the link in the chat so that you can um, look at it. Um, so this platform tackles five main areas where we see U.S.-China conflict play out um, and where we need progressives to step up and oppose an alternative framework um, and alternative policies. Um, and I don't really have the time to get into the nitty gritty of this platform. Um, I've already touched upon some of, of the themes um, in the document, um, you know, such as what the escalation of the conflict does for uh, the prospects of cooperation on climate and for human rights in communities caught in, in the crossfire of, of this conflict. Um, but this platform also digs into uh, other critical questions, um, such as, for example, the question of industrial po policy and uh, reshoring of jobs uh, in the US and what that means for the US-China relationship and for a rapid um, green transition. And just before I stop, I'll, I'll just quickly say something about this question around uh, what kind of industrial policy we can support in the US in order to promote renewable energy production, since um, China is clearly leading on that and its leadership is seen in the in the US as a, as a threat to our competitiveness and to our workers. Um, and look, it makes sense to want to blame China for decades of deindustrialization. There is a real problem that um, arose from China's successful entry in neoliberal globalization. It did create a race to the bottom that hurt workers in other places. It did create a concentration of manufacturing that is not healthy. Um, China has become the face of deindustrialization and job losses. And so it's easy for politicians to um, now use China as the scapegoat instead of taking, honestly taking responsibility and face corporate power full on. Um, but we have to be clear that those who drove and benefited from these processes were corporations, whether Chinese or American or other countries' corporations, lots of American companies exploiting Chinese workers. Um, and if we want to oppose a, a um, zero sum vision of the global economy where workers in the US can be safe only if workers in China and, and elsewhere are not. Um, we need to readdress the, these global imbalances. Um, and in order to do that, we need the US and China to cooperate on facilitating a system of global labor rights, to cooperate on facilitating the sharing of green technology to cooperate on facilitating the um, opening up of policy space uh, for all countries to implement bold, green, labor-friendly industrial policies. Um, so I'll I'll stop here because I think I'm, <laughs> I'm a little uh, over time. Um, but yeah, I encourage you all to, to read um, the document. And really, if you have any feedback or, or questions, this is a living platform, um, so we want to keep, you know, building and refining it collectively. So we'd love to 
to hear comments. Um, thank you, and I'll pass it back to Hannah. Valentina, thank you so much. That was so incredibly useful and informative. Um, so many good points. And one thing too that uh, I've been thinking about is uh, the fact that China is being kind of uh, penalized by US policymakers in a lot of ways for the overcapacity issue and making uh, green energy. China produces 80% of the world's solar panels, um, but the United States produces the majority of the world's weapons. When that industry is high, heavily subsidized by the US government through our defense spending, which this year is going to reach nearly a trillion dollars. So um, it's kind of interesting to think about uh, about those things in context. Um, but now let's let's uh, turn over to Analia to, to share more on what we can do uh, to push back um, and to fight for uh, to climate action. Thank you, Hannah. So um, as, as Hannah really amazingly went over in the beginning of my work, everyone here uh, focuses on environmental justice and education for primarily young folks. Um, but to, to kind of center community as it pertains to environment and our relationship to our environment, um, that's that's where my work lies. So I'm, I'm going to just go over a little bit about what why it's important for the U.S. to make equitable climate finance contributions. Uh, and then I'll go a little bit over our um, fair shares and then our campaign as well. So um, as everyone has stated a bunch of times, and I think is is necessary rhetoric for us to wrap our minds around in the U.S., is that the U.S. is the largest historical emitter of greenhouse gases and largest producer of fossil fuels. Um, we have a huge responsibility. So uh, in the U.S., human rights, environmental and systemic racism and injustices are constantly happening and you know, our human rights are being threatened within the U.S., and also as a result of our geopolitical endeavors. So it, it's kind of feeling like, um, how do I put this kindly? It's kind of feeling like when we're in the global arena and we're at home, uh, we are not representing our communities and we're not representing the, the present and future that we need to uh, all get behind. Um, the US's entire history has actually been one of harms caused internally, externally, and there's so many harms that need to be addressed. So um, we just hosted a summer camp, climate reparations camp, which was national um, at the beginning of August in Minnesota and uh, organizers from all over the US flew in so that we can get into this conversation on reparations. And as we know, we have a slightly different framing of reparations within the US, but I think that when we're talking about our fair shares, we are talking about reparation we're talking about repairing harm. So the way I've been talking about this and understanding this as somebody who's playing catch up, if you will, on all things global politics, um, the way I've been talking about this as is that we can use this as a, um, sorry, I'm having a brain fart. Um, we can use this as an example. Um, so if we can hope to have reparations for you know descendants of enslaved peoples and indigenous folks, in the US, um, we we should be able to make that also happen to some extent for climate harms in the rest of the world. Uh, another reason is that we have one of the most powerful voices in the world. And this is very clear at spaces like COP or the Conference of Parties um, on social media in every other possible space. I think that the US really holds that to be true that we, we have a powerful voice. Um, our voice is just, been one that showcases that we as a country and a people, we don't really embody justice or the things that we say we're about, which is really difficult being somebody that works in environmental justice and attending something like COP um, and hearing the United States say that the U.S. is all in and that, you know, we are leaders in, in climate action. And I, I feel like when you come back into our communities here, you know, we're seeing folks that are doing that work and are doing climate action, but as a country, we're just not getting there, which is disappointing, especially um, when doing work with young folks. I'm constantly asked how we maintain hope. And it, a lot of times it doesn't feel like there's much to be hopeful about if we're doing the work, a lot of us for free back home. And then knowing that globally, we're not matching the kind of intention that we're having at home. And we we already signed on to these climate finance commitments, which to me feels like not a no brainer, but if we already said we're gonna do something, I think it's come time in 2024 that we 
do the things that we say we're, we're about or that we're doing. Um, we somehow just couldn't make that climate finance happen time and again. We were supposed to commit that $100 billion a year uh, by like yesterday, and we just haven't been able to appropriate the funds. Our representatives are telling us internally that there's no, quote, political will to appropriate the funds and then turning around into a place like the UNFCCC or the Conference of Parties, COP, and claiming that not only are we leaders, but we're shining stars and we set the standard for climate action, which again is disappointing because we're, I, we're not doing that thing. So this has been what's gone into the fair shares NDC and into this work. And I'll talk a bit more about the Shift Us campaign, but I think that there's also just a disconnect in understanding within the United States. We really, I feel like the general public would think that, well, we're doing everything we can, right? But if we're not following the direction of folks that are severely harmed and people and planet that are being harmed, and they're telling us how we can make it better, we're just not listening at a certain point. Um, so, you know, saying that we're setting the standard for climate action is is not actually true. And we haven't been fully centered in reality within the US and our pledge of $17 million at COP28 last year in Dubai is just one small example. Um, so I'm, I'm not saying all of this so that anyone of us feels bad, but I think that our country, if our country is an entity and not a person, our country needs to do better in so many ways. And I think that, you know, as we're building political will and understanding and education within the US, that rhetoric is really necessary for us to have. And, and I think to push folks to consider unpacking why that makes them uncomfortable can also lead to a different conversation around, you know, why, why some of us benefit from the status quo maintaining, being maintained, if you will. Uh, there's a constant conversation amidst the general public or civil society that China's doing this and China's doing that and why aren't they doing this and why do we have to do all of this if China, for example, doesn't? And I think that this is a slippery slope because xenophobia has in infiltrated the way of thinking of a lot of people here and globally. And we're too caught up in the weeds about what other countries will do with the money if we can get it to them. And so I think something I've learned in being a part of this reparations conversation is that the harming entity, the United States, for example, uh, does not get to decide what the entity harmed or the people's harmed does with that money. I think that that's th that nuance and that um, point of contention has really put a pause on progress around harm repair and that feels like something that is more comfortable for folks in the US to wrap their minds around that, oh, we just don't know what they'll do with the money, so we can't make it happen. And and I, I need us to understand, people need us to understand that that doesn't suffice anymore. Um, it's not up to us as the people that cause the harm. We are not, the individuals haven't caused the harm, but our country has. Um, it's not up for us to decide what they're gonna do with the money because they've asked for years for funding. Um, so I'll go over super quick fair shares and then shift us, but overall, this is extremely imperative to environmental justice because we as a country are not a part of these conversations. And at a certain point, it's willful ignorance. And I think that if we frame this as only something for climate activists to pick up, then we're also not doing what we're supposed to be doing. So as Kelly so wonderfully put it, we have a fair shares NDC out now. Uh, given the timeline we're in, this is our last ditch attempt at keeping us within that 1.5 degrees, which as of right now, we're we're not on a pathway to do so. And I think that, again, that is really necessary rhetoric that we kind of, we have to keep it 100, everyone, <laughs> about what is at stake and what's really happening. So um, the fair shares process has been a long one um, that a lot of brilliant people have put intention and hard work into. So this new NDC is an updated version of a conversation that isn't new, but what is new is this version with updated finance asks and a deeper commitment to loss and damage funding and community globally. So I'm really excited about this. And I think a lot of young folks and just people who are hearing about this for the first time are excited to know that there's a political tool that we can use. And the way that we're going to do that, knowing that our fair shares NDC is dependent on 
a full fast funded and feminist fossil fuel phase out. Um, and it picks up on our previous commitments that we already said we're going to do. Um, it just kind of gets into the goal to the larger responsibility. Um, so I'll just kind of end with uh, talking about shift us. So um, if you guys are able to drop the link in the chat, that would be amazing. We are launching the Shift Us campaign next week, a week from today, actually, in New York for Climate Week. Um, it is in partnership with ELCOI, the local conference of youth, at which I just was at this past weekend, drafting the National Youth Climate Statement, um, and then the Indigenous Wisdom Keepers delegation. So we're having a party to launch this Shift Us campaign, and essentially, you know, uh, uh, thanks for dropping the theory of change in the chat. The way I would describe Shift Us is what do we need to do internally within the US to shift the way that we're understanding our responsibility to the rest of the world? We're understanding or beginning to, you know, get into the conversation around what have we said we're going to do? What are we going to do to ensure that we have a better present um, so that we can have a future uh, to begin with? So um, please stay tuned for Shift Us. Um, it'll be launching in one week. Um, our website, I think, is active now and poke around through it. But primarily, I would I would really love to challenge everyone today to start talking about this if you're not, um, even if you don't know that much about it. Uh, part of this Shift Us intention is that we're getting people in the U.S. to be talking about stuff that um, has felt outside of us, but it's actually centered with us as well. So um, I'll stop there. And I know that we have some space for questions. Thank you so much, Analia. You're doing such incredible work. Um, such incredible work. We're so grateful for you. Um, yes, folks, we still have some time for questions, so please do uh, drop those in the chat. Uh, we have a few um, on a few different issues. One kind of on the driving uh, force uh, behind uh, capitalism and imperialism and how that's uh, playing a role in ecological destruction, which we could have a whole discussion on, <laughs> a whole book on itself. Um, but uh, for our panelists, um, in our remaining time, if, if thinking about if you each want to talk a little bit about kind of the social conditions um, that would need to change and the political conditions that would need to change in order to um, get more movement on these issues, which are also broadly publicly popular. Um, from what I understand, the polling shows that most Americans actually want more the government to do more on on um, climate issues um, and are actually pretty wary of arms sales abroad. Uh, so thinking about that and what would what would need to change or what are some key messaging um, that you see uh, that you think would be important um, in this conversation at, as we're uh, getting ready to see these negotiations take place? I'm not sure if we want to follow the same order. Kelly, you want to go first? Sure. Um, I can just, so I, I think there's a lot that needs to change to get the scale of climate finance that we really need. It's going to be a profound sort of transformation of our capitalist system into one that really values, you know, the, the our different ecosystems and caring for people. Um, and so that that is a, a real, prof that would need to be a profound shift in our military spending in our you know, how we structure our government and and, and um, those pieces. Uh, I do think that there is a lot that could be done that would still be really positive and beneficial, like in the medium and short term. Um, and that is going to require really people calling out because, you know, um, it's not just whether or not people support it, it's how much are they willing to fight for it. Um, and so that's one of the places that we have seen climate finance really fall short is that while people are sort of supportive in concept, when it comes to the end of the day, when there's not that many people in the room and it, the last of the bill is being written, there just isn't anybody in there fighting for climate finance. Um, and so I think that some of what needs to be done is really building up the solidarity between frontline communities in the U.S. and frontline communities in the global south so that we're fighting for funding for both of those communities. Um, so that, you know, when we see a new climate fight, when we see the next climate bill that it includes an international portion that has a big climate finance portion so that, you know, we're taking care of frontline communities at home and also recognizing our fair share internationally. I don't know, that didn't have a lot of specifics, but <laughs> but but it's that solidarity that's really needed, I think. No, it's important to hear. Yeah. Valentina. 
Um, yeah, I mean, and, and I'm gonna stick uh, to the US-China piece of, of, of this question, but um, I mean, I kind of already mentioned it before with a, a you know, a quick reference to, to China week. Um, I think there, you know, what we are seeing our, you know, elected officials doing is, uh, you know, kind of coalescing around this very strong bipartisan support for um, scapegoating China for all the issues that we have um and and spending yeah as i said like an inordinate amount of time and resources uh passing legislation that will not solve the problems that they're um uh, you know uh, allegedly trying to address uh with this kind of legislation so i think we really need to um like move towards a positive framework that is not constantly focusing on, you know, outcompeting China. One, because it's actually unrealistic. Like, I mean, I think the US uh, is really showing how it's kind of holding on to this old status quo that just doesn't exist anymore. And and the I think the sooner we um, realize that, the, the better we will be. Um, and really focus uh, on advancing progressive policies uh, on on these crucial challenges that we face and that we talked about tonight. So, you know, instead of China week, I want to see an international climate finance week. I want to see a healthcare for all, for all week, you know, like, you know, we can we can name a thousand uh, things that would be uh, a much better way for um, the U.S. government to, you know, uh, if the concern is, you know, What's happening to our workers in you know in the midst of global competition? What's happening to our economy? Well, you know that's uh, you know that's I would suggest looking you know uh, in other directions to um, uh, figure out how to to stay afloat in this. I love it. Let's plan our climate finance week. Um, perfect. And Alia, how are you? How about you? Yeah. Um... It's come time for us to write a new narrative. I think that our people here are asking for it. Our relatives in the global South and globally are asking for it. Um, I think that one of my favorite things to name that I'm saying in as many places as possible is that um, we know that capitalism is our issue, right? And control and greed and, and you know, all of the other th like racism like there are so many issues right but um at the basis of capitalism is infinite growth and i think that uh, we need to be reminded that infinite growth is cancer and if we are only focusing on that infinite growth aspect and and not um taking a moment to acknowledge and and address systemic harms and the way things have been for pretty much everyone then we're still going to do the same old thing over and over again. So um, I, I think that's the definition of insanity, right? Expecting the same result. So, you know, it, it's it's come time for us to co-create a new reality and a new narrative that takes all of this into context. And so that's just kind of what is, what's necessary in today's day and age. So I'm really, really glad to be here with you all. And that point actually talks to a question that was in the chat on transition minerals and extraction, um, because like you were saying, unless we're addressing the root cause of exploitation and climate crisis, we, we repeat the same systems and we're seeing, um, you know, a lot of these false solutions and false climate solutions being peddled by policymakers, which are not addressing the root causes now. Um, in the last moment or so, uh, I'm wondering, I know that there's some calls to action that folks have been working on or um, are in the spaces. So I don't know if there's anything you wanna flag about ways people can get involved or upcoming events or actions um, that they can take part of. I think Valentina, Valentina, you, there's a sign on pledge for Justice is Global. Yeah, um, we have a pledge that uh, I believe we can drop in the chat. Um, but yeah, if you, you know, we're, we're doing uh, a bunch of different things. Uh, some is, uh, you know, legislative oriented and, you know, we're building um, congressional delegations both to, uh, uh, you know, sort of push our legislators on the US-China cooperation piece, but also on the 
unlocking climate finance piece. Um, so, you know, if you're interested in, you know, joining any of those efforts, um, you know, sign the pledge, we can be in touch. And similarly, we're doing uh, also a bunch of political education work because, of course, the issue is, uh, uh, you know, is not yet like super popular, right? Um, and, you know, we're doing this also in collaboration with Anali and Kelly and, you know, we were part of the climate reparation camp as well. Um, but we also want to keep doing this kind of political education work in, in in communities. So again, if you're interested in taking part of that, sign the pledge. Uh, you'll end up on a list so that we can follow up with you. That is amazing. Everyone's doing amazing work. Um, we're really grateful. We're so grateful for you all for joining tonight to also share with us um, please do everyone follow along with these campaigns um, and just appreciate you being here to learn more about these issues and working towards cooperation and climate action uh, for a more secure future for everyone. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you to 350. Uh, we hope you stay in touch um, and um, stay in touch for more soon. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thanks, everyone.